So I hope that each one of you will take a minute and sign the red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. If you'll uh, pass that down and then pass it back towards the center so that as it passes by, you can take note of the folks, uh, names of the folks who are seated around you. And especially if you're visiting with us today, I hope that you'll take a minute. There's a place at the bottom where you can share your name and address information. We'd love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. So we hope that you'll give us the opportunity to do that as well. Um, you can also fill out a prayer request card and the ushers will come around and collect those if you have a prayer request. Uh, I want to share a couple of announcements about things that are going on here. Uh, I want to say first, thanks uh, to everyone who helped with the Interfaith Hospitality Network, which uh, we hosted the homeless this week. It was a wonderful event and uh, had a lot of help and really grateful to all of you who participated that in ways large and small. And uh, there may still be, I'm not sure, but is there still no more laundry? Okay, great. So we're all taken care of, and we thank you very much for your assistance with everything. A uh, couple of other announcements that I want to share. Today, despite the weather, uh, we're going to continue with uh, the Blessing and the Animals service. So this is a great event as well and a lot of fun. And we encourage you to bring your kids and bring your pets and to come out. And uh, we're going to be doing this together with the uh, Lutheran Church out near Shawnee High School, Lord of Life Lutheran, and St. Peter's Episcopal from right across the street. It's going to happen at Freedom Park at 4 o'clock today, and we do have a pavilion reserved, so it'll be in the pavilion there. And we encourage you to come out, bring uh, your pet, and if your pet is a little too wild maybe to participate in such a thing, uh, you might bring a picture of your pet, or um, your kids can bring stuffed animals, whatever you'd like to do. And so we'd love to have you come and join us for that. Um, we have our church conference coming up. And uh, that's going to be taking place here next Saturday. And so the church conference, if you're not familiar with this, one of the things that we have to do as a congregation each year is there's some business that we have to conduct. And uh, so we invite you to come and join us for that. All members are welcome. Uh, this year, the format is going to be a little bit different in that we have a time of worship and training for some of our lay leaders. And that's going to be taking place at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, it's going to be taking place, like I said, here, and then the church conference will uh, occur at 1145. So we invite you to come. Uh, we are hosting this event, which uh, is kind of a new thing, and it involves churches from all over the district coming and joining us here in this place. So one of the things that we need help with is just some hospitality throughout the day. Uh, the day is going to start a little before 9 and run till a little after 5, and so throughout the day, we could use some help with hospitality. And there's a sign-up sheet outside, real simple. We've broken it down into one to two-hour blocks. So if you have any time next week, uh, we'd love to have uh, your assistance with that on next Saturday. Um, today, I also want to make one last announcement, and that is that after a long search, we've been working at this for a long time, we are really excited to announce that we've hired uh, Logan Crossan as our new uh, director of contemporary music. And so he's going to be starting with us uh, on October 23rd. I think we have a picture of Logan. Here's Logan. And Logan comes to us from the Haddonfield United Methodist Church. Um, this is actually a picture of him speaking. He was speaking at a, uh, a big software conference this weekend. So he was excited about that. And that's what picture that he wanted to share with us. But Logan brings a whole lot of gifts. Uh, he's a great singer. He can play, um, he can play guitar, can play drums, uh, can play keyboards, can play bass. And uh, really excited to bring him in and have him start working with us. And like I said, his start date's gonna be on uh, the 23rd of this month. So we look forward to welcoming him. I think those are all the announcements. And uh, Matt, will you lead us in the call to worship? Good morning. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Sing praises to God who created the heavens and earth. Sing praises to our creator who makes us brothers and sisters. Lift up your voices and hands to God, who is worthy of praise. Come and worshiping the God who makes us one. Center your hearts on Christ, who calls upon us to love one another. In prayer and praise and thanksgiving, we worship Jesus our Lord. Our hymn is 545, The Church's One Foundation.
please join with me in our opening prayer. God of compassion and mercy, we are your wounded and wounding children. We bring you our wounded selves, our divided society, and our broken world, seeking your healing and transforming grace. It is easy for us to point the finger at others, yet we know that we all need your forgiveness. So we lift into your presence today, not only the victims of conflicts, but also those who have called enemies, break down the walls of hatred, distrust, and bitterness, and open a way for us to reach one another in truth and love. Enable us to build a society where all can belong, share our gifts in mutual respect, and seek the new future which you offer us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in this responsive read. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and everything is becoming new. This is from God, who reconciled with us through Christ, and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to each other. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Take this time to greet your neighbors.
I'd like to invite up for children's time. Hopefully there's a child. <laughs> I'll be by myself. Are there any kids? No? No one? All right, junior choir, it's up. It's you and me today. How are you guys? Hi. All right, so today I want to talk to you about, I brought some crayons with me. Because I know that you guys like to color, and so do I. So let's look at these crayons that I have here. I can hold them. So I got lots of different crayons in here. They're really used. Some of them are used more than others. Let's look at them. I can't pour them on the ground. Oh, see, look, this one's broken. So that one's like no use to me, right? But let's look. Ooh, this one looks really used, right? It's kind of dull. But look at this one. This one's, I haven't even touched this one yet. And you know why? Because I, the color, the color orange is like my least favorite color. So I try not to use it, but sometimes you have to use the colors you don't like, right? Because what are, what are things that are orange? orange. Oranges, <laughs> pumpkins. So you have to use colors that you don't really like to use, right? But other colors, like this one, is blue. So what's blue? Your, your choir robes, the sky, the ocean. When I'm coloring Cinderella's dress in my princess books, they're blue. So things like that. You have to use all types of different crayons because we have to draw the world. So we can learn a lot from crayons because crayons are a lot like people. Sometimes we have to see crayons as people because there might not be your favorite color, but you need to use all the colors to complete the picture. And that's a good picture for the way we should see the world. The people that make up the world come in all shapes and sizes and colors. Some may have strange sounding names, like some of the crayons in our crayon boxes, right? Do you ever pick out a crayon? You're like, who named this crayon? <laughs> so, but there's so strange sounding names. Some are older, some are young, some are pretty sharp, like my orange crayon here, but some are kind of dull. They're not, they've kind of, they're not, don't, not the brightest in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Some are dressed with um, nice clothes, and some are dressed with the little soil. Their wrappers are a little ripped. But all these people, like the crayons, were made and loved by God. And that's how we should love everyone in the world, because everyone is made and loved by God. So everyone, and everyone's a different color. So rich and poor, some are brown, some are yellow, black, and red. And that kind of reminds me of a song, right? What song is that? Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. What song is that, Sarah? Do you remember the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World? So before, we, before I go back to my seat, I want to say a prayer. But today I don't want to say a prayer. I want to sing a prayer. Do you guys know Jesus Loves the Little Children? No? Well, luckily, Mr. Adams has it on the wall for us. And my dad's going to play it for us. So ready, Dad? Thank you, Kelsey. Gave you a challenging topic to work with when Kathleen was not here. Yeah. I'm sure you appreciate that a great deal. So this morning we have the opportunity to dedicate a couple of prayer shawls. I'd like to invite the members of the prayer shawl ministry who are here with us uh, this morning to come forward. Would you like to come forward as well, Bethany? And so we have two shawls here this morning. One is actually for Bethany's dad, um, who has uh, been uh, dealing with the complications from some surgery that he had. And the other one is for uh, the Crozier family. They lost their son, John, uh, recently. And so this is for them. So let's lay hands on these and let's pray together. Most gracious God, we give you thanks for the hands that have prepared these shawls, for the creativity that went into them, for the work that went into them, Lord, for the fact that in each uh, conversation, 
each stitch that went into them, that there was a prayer and a knowledge that they would find their way into the hands of someone who will value them very much and through them experience your love. Lord, we are grateful for this ministry that enables us to share a really tangible reminder of your great love for the world, especially for those who are going through difficult times. And so for Dave and Donna, we ask a blessing. For Larry, we ask a blessing. And Lord, we pray that these uh, shawls might be signs of hope and of healing for them. And Lord, we pray that you continue to bless uh, those who take part in this ministry so that they might know that their work is valued and valuable in your sight and in the sight of those who receive these. We are grateful for your power. Surround us with your love. Bless these shawls with um, the richness of your kindness toward us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody.
Good morning. This morning's scripture comes from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 47 to 53. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are to betray the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw that what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this, and he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. So over the last two weeks, we've done uh, something a little bit different with the sermons on uh, Sunday mornings, and um, maybe that's been good in your eyes, and maybe it hasn't, but in any case, the first week of the series, what we did uh, was really more of a history lesson about how we got to the place where we uh, established the canon, which is the definitive list of the books that uh, make up the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testaments. And then last week, we did something a little bit more theological, and uh, we talked a bit about what it is that we mean when we talk about the Word of God, the Scripture as the Word of God. And I made the case last week for an understanding of the Bible that's flexible enough that allows us to resolve some of the contradictions and some of the difficulties inherent in the text without missing out on what's really important. And so today, I want to continue along this path, and... Uh, I'm hoping that this might address some, a topic that maybe has been on your own heart. I know that it's a stumbling block for a lot of people, both in terms of their faith and in terms of their understanding, and that is the level of violence that we find in the scriptures. So that's what I want to spend some time dealing with today. Let's take some time to pray. God, we are grateful for your power at work in our lives. We're grateful for your power at work through the scriptures. And we ask that as we think together about what it is that you have to say to us that uh, we might hear a word from you, whether through me or in spite of me, we pray that you might speak here this morning, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember uh, years ago, before I was in seminary, having a conversation with someone that I was in a Bible study with, and uh, we had taken a little break, and uh, we were just talking, and this person asked me, do you think that God changed somewhere along the way? Because the God that I see in the Old Testament strikes me as being very different from the God that I see in the New Testament, that I see in Jesus. Now I wonder, how many of you have ever asked a similar question or had a similar thought? Some? Well, if you have, you're certainly not alone. In the early days of Christianity, uh, in fact, 144 AD to be precise, there was a Christian named Marcion who had exactly the same reaction. And in fact, he took it so far as to reach the conclusion that the gods, the gods in his view, of the New Testament and the Old Testament were two different gods. Now, that was a pretty extreme view, and with it came a lot of anti-Semitism and, and other uh, preconceived notions about how God could speak through this book. And as you might expect, the church deemed Marcion a heretic and excommunicated him. But making him go away did not exactly take away the questions that he had raised. Because those questions persist, and they persist with us down to this day. So one of the Old Testament stories that Marcion might have been reacting to is this one from Joshua chapter 6. Uh, and in particular, 20 through 21. So this is the well-known story about the fall of Jericho. So this is part of the, the cycle of stories about how Israel comes into the promised land. Now, the, 
promised land was not an empty land. So when Israel moved in, what's described is the story of the conquest of the land, and especially the conquest of these small walled city-states, and Jericho was among them. So you can go to Israel today, you can visit Jericho, and you can see uh, the foundations of what they think are these ancient walls. And so uh, you may have sung this, this song. Uh, do we have that slide for me? Um, you may have sung that song, uh, Joshua fought the Jet battle of Jericho. Do you remember that? Maybe from when you were growing up, right? So that's a song that you might have sung, but I guarantee you probably did not sing about the latter part of this verse. So here's how the story unfolds. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout and the wall fell down flat. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. So everything is wiped out. They take the city and wipe out everything and everyone. So the story of Israel conquering the promised land is, as it's told, on some level, a story of genocide. Carried out, actually, at God's command. This is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. And if you look closely, you'll find stories like this. You know, I'm going to name some examples from the, from the Old Testament, but you can also find some pretty hard words in the New Testament. Have you read Revelation lately? Right? If not, that might give you a different view of, you know, the level of violence in the New Testament. But if you look closely, you'll find these stories about how, for example, when Israel fell into sin by worshiping the golden calf at the foot of Sinai, when Moses shows up and realizes what's happening, he calls all the priests the tribe of Levi, he calls them together, and he says, put on your swords. And he sends them out among the people to carry out death sentences on all the men who had participated in this idol worship. And what the scripture says is 3,000 fell that day. And if you keep reading, God still wasn't satisfied because then after that there was a plague that took even more lives. I could cite some more examples. So, for example, the, there's a law in the Old Testament that allows rebellious sons to be taken before the city elders and stoned. Or there's a man, and this story has always troubled me, although it's a small thing in the grand scheme. The story how David is transporting the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. Now, granted, the ark was never meant to be transported on a cart, but on poles being carried by people. And supposedly that's where part of the problem arises. But this is just one of David's friends walking beside this cart when the oxen stumble. And so what does he do? Naturally, he reaches out to catch the ark before it falls on the ground. It's an important holy object. And he dies immediately. And you think, this isn't even his fault. Right? The oxen stumble. He wants to keep this thing from falling on the ground. And he's dead? Really? Or how about a psalm? And you can find it if you want to look at it. In the, it's even in the hymnal. The full text. Psalm 137 that prays for the opportunity to slaughter the children of your enemies. Now, you'd have to be extraordinarily hard-hearted, it strikes me, not to ask, ask questions about these particular passages of Scripture. And in fact, many atheists look at these passages and others as evidence that religion has violence at its core and therefore can't be redeemed. And I see this as a primary reason why many people reject faith because of all the violence that has been done and all the violence that continues to be done in the name of God throughout the world. So if you've been here the past couple of weeks, I hope that one of the things that you're taking away is that reading and interpreting the Bible is not 
as easy and as clear as we would like it to be. Now, I don't want that to be discouraging for us or say, well, this is something that I, that I, can't, I can't touch, I can't deal with, I don't know what to do with it. Because I also hope that in the time that we spend talking about the Scripture week by week, that you come to a realization and appreciation, as I have, that this is profound because it deals with every dimension of human experience, every dimension of human experience, even the ugliest parts of it. And it has something to say to us today. Scripture is vitally important to who we are as Christians. What I'd say is that growing in faith and discipleship means in part learning how to handle and understand and interpret the Scripture for yourself. Christianity without the Bible is just not possible. Christianity without the Bible is really no Christianity at all. What I'd say is that the Bible is violent in part because the world that we live in is violent. It always has been. And the experience of those who lived through the violence, of the stories that are being told in the Bible, they're, they're relaying just what they've seen and how things have happened. If you don't know about the history of Israel, because it, this little strip of land, you say, well, what good is this little strip of land? Why would it be such a big deal? Why would people want to conquer it? Because the Bible has over and over stories of other empires coming to conquer it again and again and again. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, uh, the Greeks later on under Alexander the Great. Right? Every great nation comes through that area and conquers it. Why? Because if you wanted to build an empire that surrounded the Mediterranean, you had to get to Egypt. And if you wanted to get to Egypt, that was the only way to do it, was to pass through Israel. Because you couldn't go through the Arabian Peninsula. You couldn't go through the desert. So this is what you had to do. And so the people of Israel lived with this kind of violence, generation after generation, because the armies of these conquering powers would come through. Now, we don't live with that kind of violence in our lives. But we certainly understand the threat of terrorism. We certainly understand the threat of violent crime. We understand those things. And when these things happen, we understand, too, what it's like to be hurt and what it's like to be angry and what it's like to be afraid. We just recognized the 15th anniversary of September 11th. We know what that's like. And we also know that it's not always clear to us what the proper response is as individuals or as a nation. It's unclear to us. So when we read Psalm 137, that psalm that I referenced earlier, when the writer talks about hating Babylonians that much, we can understand it, but we cannot condone it. It seems to me that even Jesus struggled with this and what to do about it and how to live it out. Because this passage that we read this morning, that's from Luke's Gospel. And if you didn't recognize it, it's the moment of Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. The moment where he's taken into custody. And in that moment, his disciples draw swords to defend him. In fact, one of the guards loses his ear. That's consistent across the Gospels, that little detail. So really, that's, that's something that, that happened. Very consistently told. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says very famously, put your sword away, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. But not so in Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel is different. And in fact, if we'd had a little more time, then I would have read that entire piece of the 22nd chapter, where Jesus tells the disciples just before this, he tells them things are changing. When I sent you out, to do ministry in my name, I sent you out. I said, do not take a staff for self-defense. Do not take a, a purse. Do not take extra clothing. Go out and do this ministry and trust me. But now Jesus says, those who do not have a sword should sell their cloak and get one. 
And so the disciples hear him saying this, and they say, well, Lord, we have two swords. Is that enough? And Jesus says, that's enough. And that's what they do right before they set out. I cannot find a commentary that can explain this to me adequately. Why Jesus would make this kind of a comment. How does this fit with the rest of his program? How does this fit with who he is? In the heat of the moment, one of the things that happens is that the disciples ask Jesus for advice. They say, well, is now the time to strike? And you can imagine them looking at each other. Okay, you told us to bring the swords. They're here. What should I do? So they ask the question, but they don't wait for the response. The very next, the very next verse is, and all of a sudden the guy's ears off, right? So they don't wait for Jesus to respond. They go ahead and they strike. It's not unlike other passages that we find in the Old Testament, particularly there's a couple passages in the book of Judges where the people of Israel are headed into battle. And so they go up to inquire of the Lord what the next step should be. But when they gather, their prayer is never, as you might expect it to be, should we go to war? Instead, their prayer is always, which tribe should enter the battle first? Those are two different questions, are they not? But isn't this human nature? Isn't it human nature for us to already have decided the course of action that seems the most appropriate to us and then to go to God to justify it? Isn't that typically how we operate? In all kinds of dimensions of our lives. And so here's our responsibility as interpreters, I'd say. Because it's an old story that repeats itself over and over again, our responsibility is to stop that story from repeating itself. That's our job. It's our job to handle the scriptures in a way that leads not to violence, but instead that leads to healing. Because after all, isn't that Jesus' response? When the soldier who's come to arrest him is injured, does not Jesus heal him? Does he not say, enough, and stop the bleeding? We know that the world is full of violence. We know that the Bible is full of violence. We know that we, our spirits, are full of violence. And our responsibility towards the Bible is not to try to defend it, because it doesn't need our defense. It's not to deny it because it really can't be denied. Anybody who can read it sees for themselves that this is what it says. Our responsibility is not to explain it away because that just makes us look like we protest too much. It's in the scripture, I believe, because it's in us. And so our responsibility then is to learn how to handle the scripture and to let that scripture handle us in ways that lead us into passive peace. That's our responsibility. Because we follow a man who went to a cross rather than taking up arms. He willingly went to the cross rather than taking up arms. We follow a savior who healed the soldiers who had come to arrest him. And so may our teaching, may our understanding, may our living out of the gospel likewise lead us in the path of peace. Amen.
men. You may be seated. And I'd like to invite uh, Clarence to come for Clarence Beveridge to come forward and talk a little bit on behalf of the uh, outreach committee about the crop walk, which will be taking place uh, in just a couple of weeks. Thank you, Joe. Whether you say love thy neighbors as you love yourself or treat others how you want to be treated, the golden rule is a backbone of our Christian faith. So the question is, who are our neighbors? One of our neighbors pictured in the video is a 50-year-old mother of four named Eunice. She lives in the dry lands of Kenya. Each morning, her day would begin at 5 a.m. as she walked to gather fresh water. She would return home at around 11 a.m. to start her work for the rest of the day. Thanks to crop walk donations to Church World Services, Eunice Community was given a water retention system to collect and store fresh rainwater, keeping her from having to make that lengthy trip every day. On Sunday, October 16th, members of Medford United Methodist Church will be participating in the crop walk. We are looking for people to come and walk, as well as monetary donations in support of those walking. To sign up, make a donation for additional, or ask additional questions, please stop at the crop walk table in the narthex behind the service. The outreach committee would like to thank our crop walk coordinators, Linda Campbell and Wayne Richards for their leadership. As well, we look forward to your support as we help Church World Services serve Eunice and millions of other people like her. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. If you're visiting with us today for the first time, we want to say thank you so much for being here. We welcome you as our guests. You don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the plate. We look forward to welcoming you again soon. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts.
please join with me in our prayer of dedication. Lord, with this action of offering, we tell your story, how you sustain your church from generation to generation. You deal generously with us. You give great gifts. Your goodness is everlasting. Accept the gifts of your hands and the thankfulness of our hearts. Hearts and hands and voices around the world, all lifted and in praise to you. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we'll celebrate uh, communion with Christians around the world. Uh, the idea of a World Communion Sunday is an idea that came out of the ecumenical movement of the 20th century. And it was an opportunity, especially for Protestants who don't uh, celebrate communion quite as often as our uh, Catholic and Orthodox brothers and sisters, uh, to be able to have at least one Sunday where together uh, with people around the world and Christians in all kinds of places, that we might be able to share in this sacrament all together as a sign of our unity. So uh, we're doing that today and participating in World Communion Sunday. You can also find this is one of the Sunday, special Sundays of the United Methodist Church. Uh, associated with a special offering, and you can see an offering envelope in the bulletin. If you'd like for more information about that, you can read through some of the material that's on the, uh, on the offering envelope. This morning, we'll receive by intinction, which means that you'll be given a piece of bread to dip in the cup. We'll come by the center aisle. We'll return by the side aisles. If you can't come forward for whatever reason, please uh, let us know. We'll make sure to bring the elements to you. We'll have gluten-free communion available. And I'd encourage each person to be in prayer for that person uh, in front of you in the line as you come forward so that everybody can be prayed over individually today. So let's continue now with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And because you are good, we offer to you this morning our joys and our celebrations and our thanksgivings. What are some of the joys and celebrations that you have this morning? Abby. Amen. All right, very good. Congratulations. Are there other joys today you want to celebrate? Yes, amen. So for being able to get uh, moved from one house and into a new house, it's great. Absolutely. That's a, that's a big deal. This event started, uh, I think this is the third year for it. The first year we started with maybe four or 500 youth. And uh, now we're up to 11, 1,200. It's, been, it's really been a wonderful growth in that event. We're really grateful for that. Are there others? So with your people on earth, we join the, in all the company of heaven. We praise your name and we join together in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. We trust that whenever we gather in his name and lift our prayers to you that you hear us. And so we come to the table this morning we know with many concerns upon our hearts. What are some of the concerns that you bring this morning? for Bethany's family. Are there others? Oh, 
Uh, so we pray for the people of Syria. We pray for your, some damage from the air conditioner at your house, okay? And certainly we want to remember this week um, those who were injured and uh, the one person who died in the accident in Hoboken um, also for uh, just for other victims of violence today, especially as we think about this uh, together. Lord, we thank you for your son, and we thank you for everything his coming means for our lives and for our world. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, we know that you gave birth to your church, that you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and that you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. We remember how on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, how he gave thanks to you, how he then broke the bread and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember, too, how when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He shared it with his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. are those who follow the Prince of Peace. Let us go forth to be people of peace. In the name of Christ, amen.